Behind the Brand features the people who are making things happen. Get the insight to grow your biz from experts who've done it. Get Behind the Brand. Sponsored by Raven Internet Marketing Tools. Hi, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with Sally Hogshead, author of the book Fascinate and creator of HowToFascinate.com. Sally, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. So great to have you. I'm so happy to be here. Well, I, I, I truly am fascinated by this book. I want to dive into it. I have lots of questions. Before we start, uh, it's a typical question I ask, how did you get this job? I studied what makes one person more fascinating than another. I wanted to understand why is it that some people captivate us, some people persuade us, but most people we ignore or we forget them. So I studied what it is about people's personalities that makes their brand more fascinating than another. And what I found is that there's seven different ways that a personality can fascinate. And by studying this, I got the job of Chief Fascination Officer of Fascinate, Inc. So this is a business you started your own. Yes. And how long ago was this? I started it when the book came out in, um, in 2010. Okay. I transitioned away from advertising and into helping people and brands become more fascinating. So you have a brand background, though, right? You were a creative director or something? Yes. Yeah, I was a creative director at Kirsten Porter Bogusky and, and uh, a lot of other advertising agencies. I had my own agency. And um, I love working with brands. I love the creative process. I love the, um, being able to take a brand and figure out what exactly is that, that beating heart inside of the brand, that if you can express that in a way, then people want to become advocates of the brand. They want to be involved with the brand. They want to, they want to touch it and talk about it. And yeah. they want to, most of all, they want to buy it. But it's even more fascinating to be able to do that with people. Who's the book for? Is it for just for brands or does it apply in other places? Well, that's an interesting question because when the book came out, the book was originally for marketers or for people who wanted to understand how do they create a more persuasive message. You know, a politician who needs to talk to voters, a little league coach who needs to talk to his team. But what I found over time is that marketers were really trained to think in a way that's pretty artificial. Um, I actually don't enjoy talking to marketers quite as much because we in marketing think that we can control people's behavior in this very manipulated way with bolted on strategies right that copy. we all learn. All right, you know, we write copy, we come up with a strategy, we do research, we do all of these things that, that are really just trying to pull strings on people's decision making. And uh, I think that fails most of the time. I think most marketing fails miserably because it's trying to, it's trying to manipulate people. Um, I think that there's a different way of looking at it, which is to look at their natural hardwired tendencies. And if you look at somebody's hardwired, hardwired response mechanism, then you can naturally create a much, more, um, a, a much more compelling way to be able to create a relationship with them. So this is about striking chords, about making connections. It's about understanding other people. It's understanding other people, and it's understanding that there are seven different ways that you can talk to them, and that each way of talking to them has a different result. It's a, it's, it's a roadmap. It's a system. Okay. It's almost like, imagine that you have a set of golf clubs, and each club is going to have a different result. If you, you, so specifically, if you want to be the leader, if you want to be the authority, you should use the power trigger. The power trigger is the one that's going to exude your confidence. It's going to make you an expert. It's immediately going to have people take what you're saying much more seriously because you're going to be the most influential, decisive voice. People who use the power trigger, they tend to be opinionated. They, they tend to make decisions very easily. They're, um, they, they're very different than people who use, say, the alarm trigger. Mm -hmm. People who use the alarm trigger are very much about safety. They want to be able to protect themselves and other people. They're very cautious. They like structure. They really like rig rigid uh, format that they can feel safe within. They like to know what the rules are so they can follow those rules. What type of occupations tend to fall into that category? Uh, the alarm trigger? Yeah. The people who really like structure. So you'll see these people in the building department, in, the, um, in, 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 in any type of a field in which people need to be able, they succeed by following the rules. Something um, predictable. Operations. Exactly. Yeah. So um, I would not want a tax attorney who used the passion trigger because I would have wonderful meetings with him and he could write great letters to the IRS and he could make wonderful presentations in court, but he wouldn't necessarily be able to get my taxes done on time, on budget, e exactly the way it needed to be to follow the rules. Okay. Every single occupation has a different trigger prototype that usually fits with it. So there's seven different triggers. Let's break it down. What are they? 
There are seven different triggers, and each one creates a different response. So let's take, for example, there's the power trigger. Power is about command and control. Passion is about creating connection with emotion. Prestige is about elevating with respect. Mystique is about taking a step back so others come closer. Alarm is about pushing them with urgency so they take action quickly. Okay. Um, rebellion is about changing the game. So you surprise, you do something different than is expected. And then there's trust, which is about binding them close to you so they know exactly what to expect from you. Consistency and reliability. How does someone figure out what their triggers are? Well, funny you should ask. <laughs> I developed a test to help them do exactly this. The test is at fscoretest.com. Okay. Um, what we find is that it, once you know how somebody fascinates, the way in which their personality naturally influences opinion, then you can predict what they're going to succeed at, how they're going to lead, how they can potentially turn people off, how they can be more persuasive in all the things that they do. Okay, so this is good for companies. I mean, uh, HR people pay attention. I mean, you can come in, you can have the whole staff take the test and and uh, hopefully manage people a little bit better. Yeah, exactly. And we have at howtofascinate.com, we have exactly the test to be able to do that. I'll give you ex- an HR example. If you have two people working on a team, one of them has the rebellion trigger, which is about innovation and independence and surprise. These people tend to be irreverent. They're very quick-witted. They like to be able to explore the options. They love to brainstorm. So they right. really enjoy generating different ways of approaching a problem. On the other hand, if you pair a rebellion person with an alarm person, they're going to be very uncomfortable, both of them, because the alarm person is going to want to shut down options. They like to be able to know exactly what's going to be coming next so that they can feel safe and that they can have a procedure. Give me a roadmap. Give me a roadmap and I'll follow it. Whereas whereas the rebellion person is saying, let's go on a road trip. In the same way, if you have somebody who's passion, a passion person loves to be able to connect. They want to play. They like to be able to participate. They're social. They're expressive. They're intuitive. They're impulsive. Yeah. They make decisions without necessarily thinking it through. If you pair them with somebody like an alarm person, that also may not go well. I know people who cannot talk without putting their hand on someone else. You know, it's, it's like a connection. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes, yes. That's, a, that's a passion It's the sign. only way to communicate. Yeah. Right. And, you know, and, and here's the thing. That, that it's not that there's a right way or a wrong way to be. There's no one better way to fascinate. But if you have a role in which somebody is a caregiver or a nurse or a customer service person, it's going to be very effective for them to be able to have that natural inclination yeah. to persuade that way. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, if they're, if they're an engineer, that probably wouldn't be the right job for them. Not only are they not going to be happy, but they're probably not going to be as successful. Yeah. You're in my personal space or you're crowding my scene. Right. It is, right? It, what we see with engineers, people who have a more linear way of thinking, more analytic, they tend to use the mystique trigger. The mystique trigger is about left brain thinking. It's about knowing where you want to go and then having a very private, independent process to be able to get there. People with the mystique trigger do not like to share along the way. They hate drama. They don't, they, you know, they, they, it's sort of like, I don't want to know how the sausage is made. I'm not going to show you what I'm doing. (laughs) Let me just show up with the result. And, um, and so they're outstanding in roles in which they don't enroll people in their process. They simply deliver the results. So we love them in, um, say, in, in, in more of a, more of a back end role. Okay. Um, whereas a a passion person would be miserable with that. Give us some classic uh, industries or occupations for this passion. Well, the passion trigger, I mean, people with the passion trigger are great at standing in front of the room and communicating with people okay. because they, they, they tend to use a very active body language. They tend to have a lot of, um, they make eye contact. They bond very quickly. Are you so, a passion person? Well, as a matter of fact, I am. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting <laughs> <you> that. Tell? <laughs> Um, it, it, passion people are, um, they tend to be more creative because they're more right-brained. Mm-hmm. They tend to be uh, very expressive, so they, they love to be able to share their emotions. They love the process because for them, it's all about breaking down the boundaries and having transparency between people. Self-expression. Um, self-expression. So along the creative process, the passion people are the ones who are saying, here are the options of what we could do. Here are the possibilities. They tend to be optimistic. They have big hearts. We can, um, we, we can rely on them to create emotion. On the other hand, yeah. as with every trigger, there's a downside, and the downside of the passion personality is that it tends to not be goal-oriented. So tell me another one of these triggers. Well, let's talk about the trust trigger, because everybody wants to be trustworthy. Here's the deal on trust. Our brains neurologically are completely founded on patterns of yes. trust. If we want to be able to be trusted, we have to establish very clear patterns. We have to give people an extremely clear idea of exactly what we're going to deliver. Mm-hmm. People who use the trust trigger tend to be very stable. 
They're dependable. They don't change. They have a set routine. They know what they like. They know what they don't like. And they make it very clear okay. about w- where they're going to go. The problem is they tend to be predictable. What occupations? Well, um, like a CFO would okay. have, would, would be, we, we, it's, it's founded upon history. People who use the trust trigger like to be able to look backwards to know how they're going to act. Um, they, they tend to not be in the creative department. They tend to not be the ones who are going to come up with the big idea because they're not oriented on surprise. And so what we see within companies is that if you have people with the rebellion trigger and people with the trust trigger, they can make a really good combination because the rebellion people are going to take it into the world of innovation, into the future, into thinking not what has been but what could be. Right. The trust people are going to add the stability and the foundation. They're going to be that bedrock of, of um, how to make sure that the company stays, yeah. st- has some ballast. Yeah, it keeps some good balance in. Exactly. What's another trigger? Prestige. Now, prestige is about earning respect. And people who have the prestige trigger tend to be very detail-oriented. They're very aspirational. When they look at a situation, they know exactly, they can see, they can literally see differently how things could be better. They can look at, they can look at what you're wearing and see how, how they would change it and how they would improve it. Um, the downside of the prestige trigger is that although we respect them, we can be intimidated by them. Are these like PR professionals? Are these political figures? What's the- you, you, you know, what's interesting about the prestige trigger is they tend to be people who, um, because they're so goal-oriented, and because they're constantly looking at how can I make myself better and how can I make my career better, they're very unsatisfied in jobs in which they're not given a lot of attention and respect. Sometimes they they, they like to be able to be the center of attention. They like to be able to um, see in a concrete way how they're improving all the time. So if you have a prestige employee, if you know that your employee has prestige as one of the primary personality traits, it's, uh, it's very important that you give them every year, give them concrete goals, tangible rewards so that they can see the ways in which they're improving and the ways in which the company is adding value to them. So they need to be told how they're doing on a constant basis. On a constant basis because that's what they thrive on. And here's the deal. If you do that, then the way in which they repay you as a company is that the prestige people are going to earn others' respect. They just, they naturally have a sense of presence. I find, um, anecdotally, what I find is they tend to be extremely well-groomed. They tend to be um, great at being able to present themselves with with flair. They're very articulate. and They're they're, self-starters. Probably too. They, they, they are self-starters, not as much as a power personality. I mean, the right. power personality is going to be more confident and they're going to have much more energy behind the goal. The prestige person uh, um, can actually alienate the people around them because they're so focused on, on achieving the result that they want that sometimes they can, they can lose connection with the people around them. And that's where the passion personality comes in. When somebody with a, a passion plus prestige is a quintessential advertising personality because they're good at understanding people, but they're very aspirational at being able to see the next goal. What else you got? (laughs) Oh, let's see. We have two more triggers. Well, um, let's talk about the alarm trigger for a little bit. The alarm trigger is the one that makes us do things that we don't necessarily want to do. It's the reason why you might wake up on a morning early because you have to go to work. It's the reason why you pay taxes. It's the reason why you might go on a diet. Or you and I are both sugar junkies, so Mm -hmm. it's the reason why we might stop eating sugar is because of a sense of alarm of if you don't do this action, then something bad will happen. The great thing about people with the alarm trigger is they help make sure that certain actions take place. Um, I need an alarm personality on my team to be able to make sure that I stay on time, on budget, because I'm a, I'm a passion, rebellion Yeah, I'm thinking fitness trainer. I'm thinking right. um, personal coach. Anybody who is in charge of um, creating organization, anybody who's in charge of, of providing structure in an unstructured situation, so a producer, an event planner, um, a, 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 an outstanding personal assistant, somebody who is keeping things on a certain type of mm-hmm. track. These personalities are really, really valuable within organizations. They tend to not... Primary alarm triggers are, tend to not be the ones who are the leaders. They tend to not be the CEOs because they're not as much about a vision. They're much more about maintaining yeah. the reality. Schedule manager, you know. A schedule manager, right. Yeah. Traffic and manager, so, ad manager. All this yeah. Stuff. So if you're recruiting for a company, if say, say if you, Brian, wanted to be able to recruit, you could know ahead of time before you even... Um, but before you even started interviewing people, if you could say, well, I need this person to be, um, I need this person to be innovative, visionary, pioneering, well, then by all means, you should be hiring a passion or rebellion personality. You would not want to hire an alarm personality. On the other hand, if you're going to be hiring a manager who had to be in charge of, of producing a structure, then you definitely wouldn't want a passion rebellion personality because they're going to be saying, we could do this when you're saying, well, okay, but what are we doing? 
So when I take the test, I get a result. It's a combination of these triggers, right? Yes, exactly. How there, does it work? Well, the, there are seven different triggers. When Originally, when we developed the F-score, when we developed the F-score test, we thought that there were seven triggers, and it was founded on that. But what we learned, now that we've had 70,000 people take the test... Wow. Yeah, I know, right? Isn't that cool? But we, we've seen all this data, and I've had the opportunity to meet tens of thousands of these people when I speak. And what we've learned is that personalities are actually very much a combination. So you have a primary trigger. Okay. It's the one that is the way in which you're most likely to influence the behavior of most others. Most dominant. It's your most dominant trigger, okay. right. Then you have a secondary trigger, which is the one that adds flavor. It's the one that defines how you use the primary trigger. So yeah. I, for example, am passion with rebellion underneath. If my, if my combination were different, if I were passion and, say, power, then I would not be focused on the change and innovation and creativity of rebellion. I would be more focused on pushing out towards the result. So in the How to Fascinate test, what we've done is we've broken down these not just seven types, but it's seven times seven because it's primary, secondary. So there are actually 49 different personality types. Okay. And we've learned that if you can isolate, once you, when somebody takes the how to fascinate test, we can isolate exactly how they're going to behave in a myriad of circumstances based on their personality triggers and how they're just, how, how, how people perceive them. This is fun. It's, you know what? You know what's <laughs> totally fun? Here's what I love about this. There are a lot of psychology tests out there. I'm not a psychologist. Right. A psychology test is based on how your personality sees the world. This is different, though. This is, a, this is really, at its heart, a branding test. It's about how the world sees you. Mm -hmm. It's about the effect that you have on other people. Perceptions. The perceptions that other people are going to have of you. And what I've learned is there's, there is not one way that's better than another way. But there are natural strengths. And if you can identify your natural strengths, if you can, if you can identify it and then figure out how do you harness that, and how do you apply it in the most effective possible way, then you can be far more fascinating to your customers, to your boss, to your coworkers, to your team, uh, to, to your kids, to, to, to your loved ones. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, like you, I have kids, and I want to be the most fascinating person in their life, far more so than the figures they see on television, or their Nintendo characters, or Darth Vader. Sure. I want to be the one who's giving the messages. So I need to know how to understand how do I communicate to my kids in a way that not only fits my personality, but fits the message that I want to be able to communicate with them. That's really what this is about. It's not yeah. just, it's not, it's not a marketing plan. It's really much more about we all have a message. We all have something that we want to say, that we want to be heard, that we, that we, the effect that we want to have on all the people in our lives. And, but if we don't know how to communicate that message, the message fails, whether that's me telling my kids, stay off drugs, <laughs> or that's me saying to um, a consumer, you should buy this laundry detergent over that one. A lot of people watching this show, they're small business owners, entrepreneurs, marketers trying to put the puzzle together. Um, Ooh, let's talk about that. Yeah. So what would you say to them? Uh, give us some maybe tactical stuff. Great. Case studies. Let's, let's talk about it. Okay. Well, first of all, if you want to drive bottom line dollars, if you immediately need to close a sale, you should use the alarm trigger. The alarm trigger is the one in which you would add scarcity, like we only have 10 left in stock, or you might put a time limit on it, like you would say this is available today only, right. or you would heighten urgency around a problem, such as saying, if you don't buy this, here are the consequences of what's going to happen. Um, like Federal Express, if you don't go FedEx, you can't know if it's absolutely positively going to be yeah. there overnight. Puts the fear on you. It puts the fear on you, exactly. Now, Here's the deal about the alarm trigger, though. The alarm trigger creates no connection. The alarm trigger is purely the utility of closing the sale. So you're not going to get advocates. You, people will not love your brand. They'll, they'll act, but they won't necessarily like you. If you want them to love you, then you have to use the passion trigger. The passion trigger is the one in which you create an emotional connection. Okay. Um, uh, for, for example... Recently, I, I checked into a small hotel named the Iron Horse Hotel in Milwaukee. Now, I checked in, and then right next to me, there was another check-in, and this was the check-in for dogs. Okay. And it had a little sign 
that said the Iron Horse Hotel welcomes VIP pooches. And then they, in chalk, they wrote in the names of the dogs that were going to check in that day. Nice. Now, I don't have a dog, but if I had a dog, I would almost want to go to the Iron Horse Hotel just so I could check my dog in because they had like dog treats and water yeah. and the dog's name of the dogs that were checking in that day. It's a great example of, in an in a incredibly inexpensive way, they're tapping into an emotional connection of something that's obviously a huge priority to the people who are traveling with dogs. So in doing so, the people are going to be willing to pay more to stay at the Iron Horse. They're going to they're going to go out of their way to be able to stay there. And of course, they're going to talk about it in social media. Yeah, they're going to share those experiences. Right. And they're going to share them passionately. Sally, thank you so much for being here. Really great talking to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Brian. This Behind the Brand episode is brought to you by Raven Internet Marketing Tools, powerful data and tools for online marketers. Get a free trial at raventools.com slash behind.